So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this, this, uh, this is working and everyone can see us. So something to everybody. Thanks for joining us um, for the third live in the Art of Seeing collaboration with us. Say a little bit about Sacred Footsteps. Um, we are a um, online publication dedicated to history, culture and travel, but from a Muslim perspective, um, which is why uh, we teamed up with Art of Seeing, um, which is um, a tour company um, also based on similar um, aspects of photography and spirituality um, run by no other than uh, Peter Sanders and his um, company. Um, so today we're just going to touch on um, general topics around um, travel, photography and spirituality. Um, and I know CD Peter you've been doing some lives anyway this week. So firstly how are you and how yes. is it going? I'm good, I'm good. Being quite creative, this is good. I like it. Yeah, that's good. So we're all in the lockdown, so we thought um, we'd do this series together. Um, in this live, I think um, I'm going to, so I haven't even introduced myself. Uh, my name is Yassi, I'm a contributor at Sacred Footsteps. Um, and we've got a podcast and also an Instagram page and um, a website full of our blogs, so check that out um, when you have a chance. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just going to get right into it. Um, and I think my first question uh, is probably around this sort of like digital age and era that we're in. And I'm guessing, as you already know, um, we're constantly bombarded with content every day, especially photography. And I just wondered what your opinion and thoughts are in such a sort of oversaturated market. So how do you remain consistent and different while also being authentic and true to your art form? Um, How do I remain? Yeah, from a personal perspective. Yeah, I mean, I was I was sort of thinking about the sixties because the sixties music was the thing, music and lyrics was the thing, and that was the language that the youth used. But I think now today it's images, and it is a, it is a, it is its own language. It's a global language. And I think people need to know how to use it and develop your own style. And I think because I've been doing it for so long, I have a kind of style that is, is kind of my own thing. And uh, I think it's just, I just always try to keep to that. But I mean, I have been having kind of sabbatical from taking pictures, which is quite interesting for me. Yeah. Because I've taken so many and, you know, um, I think having done Art of Seeing workshops, I suddenly realized there was a whole other generation of young people that were quite happy to roam around the world and document it. And it kind of took the pressure off me a little bit. So you don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> it's not that I don't have to do it, but I can pick and choose what I do. I felt like I had to go to every country and document it before it all disappeared. And, and uh, so what do you yeah. think about the instantaneous nature of things now? Because obviously when I've read your books and I, I we've just had a pre-convo where I told you I first met you when I was 14 and it was at a living Islam camp and you had to buy the book and meet the photographer and talk to them. <laughs> we didn't have this platform um, yeah. back then. And uh, for me, your photography has always been purposeful and meaningful um and full of intention and how does that sort of do you think that's compromised with sort of the instant nature of photography now so now you can just take something put an yeah, yeah. on it and post it and and everybody loves it and so what what about that dynamic that's that shift I, I i to me it doesn't because that is one kind of form of it but i think you know serious photographers will always have their own because for me the ultimate goal is to print something up and display it you know in some form and, and so that for me is always the end goal it needs to have that kind of quality that it can be seen small but it, it should see be seen big and you know be still equally powerful i mean the trouble is a lot of images on screen don't stand up to being printed up to large sizes and stuff yeah. and that's and to me that's a sign of a good image you know that it can be either of those absolutely um you you just touched on sort of the sixties when i first started and i was saying that how i got into your photography the first uh, the first taste that i had of it was actually those photographs 
because I grew up listening to Bob Dylan and Cat Stevens used to for Sam, Jimi Hendrix. Although it's not, it's not my era and it's not my age, like that's the music I grew up on. And, and for me, the photographs you have now, there's such strong parallels to the iconic, like there's icons now of the Muslim world for want of a better term and the icons you had back then. And for me, there's a strong, still a strong message of like, um, there's, mean, there's meaning behind both of them. And I just wondered what parallels you saw in your journey from that time in the 60s and this sort of rock and roll world to then navigating through your life and then photographing sort of saints and sages that we currently have. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, because I've been looking back at all my stuff and that's part of the fun I'm having now is, um, you know, digging up old slides I haven't found before and scanning them and editing them and stuff. I've just actually been doing some today. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of really interesting. And they do take on a different meaning after sort of 50 years. I think for me, and people always say, well, how did, you know, you used to photograph all these icons and now you photograph saints. But to me, it's not a different process because for me, they were my kind of, I don't want to say heroes, but they were the poets of the time. We were listening to what they had to, had to say because this, it was a kind, there was a revolution taking place in the 60s, even of just of the mind, you know, and a reaction against the culture that people found themselves in. And, you know, it's not different to what's happening now. There was wars, you know, wars would just sort of break out. There was always a threat we were going to go into World War Three. You know, and so there was this kind of strange feeling that life was very fragile. And I, the youth really spoke out about it and protested it in their own way. They wanted peace, they wanted love, they wanted to break away from all of that. And so that movement happened then. And, and sort of similar things with understanding what was happening to the planet, all that's happening again now. Yeah. I mean, when I talk to young people, they've got that same motivation. And I think it's really interesting because the, the youth are going to inherit this mess that we've left behind. And therefore, they need to speak up about what's happening. And I think this kind of lockdown has made people realize, well, actually, it's quite, you know, we don't need, do we need all these planes flying around all the time? Do we need all this traffic? Do we need to be traveling at such a pace that we don't, we can't even appreciate life a little bit i've always said that you know in england it's all about money the whole life is about economic value whenever it snowed they would say oh we've lost millions of pounds because it snowed today yeah. Yeah. but other people kids go out it's snowing yeah. you know, thank god it's beautiful yeah. so it's a different approach to life you know yeah. um i think in photography we need to sort of have this i guess childlike eye in the world yeah. because everything is new and inspiring. I remember reading in your book that you said that good photography is God given. Um, and so having that moment is like a gift from God almost. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you can touch on that a bit, because often I see people that have joined your tour groups and stuff are, are quite young and really keen on learning. And so the people that we've been speaking to from your group have been like really enthusiastic about learning more about the art and process. So how, how do you keep that, that sort of wonder when you've photographed so many people and been to so many places? How do you sort of maintain that? Well, I, I think for me personally, I learned that if you sit long enough, you'll get the picture. And, you know, yeah. we, we had a young guy in one of the workshops and I just said to him, don't run around, just sit in the same place. Mm -hmm. And actually when we came to review the pictures, his was the best. And it was yeah. really amazing. He just sat and he got these incredible pictures of birds and everyone was stunned by them. And he just said, I, I did what you said. I just, I just sat still in one place. And so there's great wisdom in that. I mean, spiritually, there's great wisdom in that, you know, because we tend to be, we're, we're kind of fidgety by nature, you know, human beings. And uh, we're always like our thoughts are all over the place. Our actions are all over the place. But actually, when you just calm down and, okay, this is it, this is where I am, you know, you can start to enjoy things from a different perspective. Yeah, and be, sort of be in the moment and be present. Um, yes. 
in in terms of that then um and talking about sort of so i guess like in the 60s and things like that people were used to being photographed people i can't they were celebrities now when you go and photograph people it's it's people who are saints and sages who live in isolation and seclusion by choice because they want to draw closer to god and so the difference is they're not used to being photographed and i know i i remember listening to your talk a while back where you you said that for some reason they allowed you into their space and you were able to do that and i guess like people who do come from the west like myself included we do have a privilege and an access um into these spaces that are really fortunate and i think you've used that in a really beautiful way um have they ha, how has it been sort of that interaction like photographing someone who's not used to being photographed like taking your time with it obviously producing something that many people around the world resonated with like how how was that experience for you well, I, to be honest i didn't have as much time as i would like and I, you know I often look at those pictures and think oh they could have been so much better mm -hmm. <clears throat> You know, many of them were very elderly and I didn't have a lot of time with them. I, I had to be prepared as soon as I went in. I mean, if it was possible, I would go in the room first and just make sure I knew what the exposures was and where the best place was to sit them. So when it came to do the picture, I might only have like three minutes with them or something. I didn't because many of them were elderly. They didn't want to sit for ages. So um, I tried to make it as easy as possible. And look at some of them and I think well, they could have been so much better, but they are what they are. And the thing about those people is that they don't have egos. You know, they, they just, they know who they are in themselves. They can just be themselves in front of you. Whereas most of us, I mean, I hate having my picture taken, you know, especially if I'm on an off day or something and someone's going to stick this camera in you. Yeah. And, you know, as, as Car uh, Henry cartier Bresson said that, you know, in front of a camera, you're naked. It doesn't mean physically naked, but you you yourself are exposed. Yeah. Yes. And, and when we know that as human beings, and so we, you know, that's why the whole selfie generation is a kind of strange thing, because it's kind of opposite to the saints and sages. It's like putting on this face for the, for the picture. You know, I'm this confident person and everything. Yeah. But actually, in reality, we're not. Whereas they, they don't try and do that, they just are themselves and that's... Yeah. That's so really interesting how we've invested that. And yeah. yeah. And how we, I guess like we want to be out there and we want to be liked and by yeah. certain, uh, internally where we struggle. Um, whereas when you've met these people, it's probably the complete opposite, like their, their struggles are with, like, with God and not with other human beings um just touching on your book that's out now and available for purchase um uh the aspect of uh, i know it's the meetings with mountains in your terms what did you mean by that in terms of like the greatness and grandness of the people you were meeting or the elusiveness um what was in that title um i, did, I didn't come up with that title actually uh hamza yusuf came out so oh, Yusuf cool. came up with that idea. I mean, it, we, I talked to him about the project and everything, and he'd seen some of the pictures. And he, it was his idea. And as soon as he said it, I knew that was the title for the book. The more I started to do the book, I realised how that title was perfect for it, because they are, you know, there's this idea that the mountains are like pegs which hold down the the earth, and mm -hmm. those people are like that. You know, they're they're points of reference for us and their stillness, the, the, the analogy. And when I met um, Mustafa Salama, who's this um, Muslim, the first Muslim, well, his story is interesting if you don't know about it. He's a refugee from Palestine, but he had a dream that he was standing on the highest summit, calling the, calling the, making the call to prayer. And he called his friend up and said, what's the highest summit? And they said, that's Mount Everest. And so he'd never climbed a mountain in his life. He learned how to climb and he climbed Mount Everest and he called the Adhan on there. And he's since climbed the seven highest summits and oh. done the same thing. And so when I, I asked him for a quote for the book and he said this thing that when, when, he climbed, when he climbed these summits, it was like being with the prophets that he felt, you know, that this, and so, you know, these similitudes of, very this idea of a mountain is very strong actually yeah um yeah i found it i found it really profound and 
when you talk about traveling so at sacred footsteps we talk a lot about traveling with intention and purpose and we mean sustainability and sustainable travel and also like all the rules generally about consent and all of that but also we we try and sort of talk about what our intention is when we travel to places like what is our purpose for this is it just yes. the fun or we just go down a holiday are we traveling because we want to capture something that's going to spiritually change us or uplift us so for you when you travel um either to take photos or just to travel spiritually what has been your intention and what have you gained from seeing all these different places and people from a personal perspective i think it's different for different places i mean for mauritania Sheikh Hamza showed me uh, a picture of Sheikh Marabah Talha. It was actually a, bad, a very bad video. He said, I want you to come and photograph my teacher. Mm. I took one look at it and I could tell that, that he was somebody that I had to go. So I went just for that intention to meet him and photograph him. With the Muslims in China, I always knew about that there were Muslims in China from very early, uh, I think in early 70s, I'd seen some pictures and I was always wanted to go and to meet them and to document them because i like the idea that they they are they are muslim but they're also chinese yeah they're not someone that's taken on an arab culture mm -hmm. they are really chinese, really chinese. Yeah. because because they are a minority like we are a mon minority in in the uk yeah. and therefore for me it's very important that we're british but that we're also muslim that we retain yeah. we retain our identity because that's part of our way that we can communicate with the host community is that we are English, but we have their own belief system. And that's yeah. super important. Yeah. yeah so and your work, sorry, your, your work on sort of your work that you've done within the British Muslim community, sort of navigating that process, that very much sort of ties into that solidifying a British Muslim identity. Yeah. We do have one as much as we think we don't. It was yeah. really, and it was really challenging when I decided to do it because I like said, okay, does every woman I photograph have to wear a scarf? Yeah. Does every guy I have to photograph have to have a beard? And I yeah. was thinking, but Islam isn't those things. If we say that it is those things, that makes it easy. Islam's not easy. It's difficult. So it can't be just about exterior things. It's about inward things. And so, yeah, I love doing that project. I met so many really fascinating people it really opened up england to me and yeah. uh, endeared me to england as well and what i think is interesting is when we think about islam sometimes even i forget that we always look to other parts of the world and we always look to the middle east or south asia yeah. or and we forget our own land and actually the muslims here and the communities that we've built and the struggles yeah and immigrant communities that have made new lives here mm -hmm. so for me that project was really interesting because i think it was reminding especially british muslims and people like me that you have a space and you have a home and you have an identity because i think someone coming from sort of third culture diaspora often feels like well i don't quite fit into my pakistani identity because i'm yeah, pakistani. Yeah. I don't quite fit into my british identity so for me that was like well actually the wholeness of it is being muslim Yes. And so that that fits into both elements of it. So yeah, I, I, I really loved that project. Um it didn't get seen as much as I want. I really wanted it to be seen here. Strange thing, it went to 40 countries around the world. But yeah. it, it's only been seen here, I think, three times or something. And I really did it for here. Yeah. I really wanted to make it like a bridge to the wider community. And uh it's strange maybe maybe it'll happen at some point but um it, yeah. there might be a turning again and then i think with with things like this um there's like timings where it feels really needed i feel like now it's really needed maybe yeah. it's a re-release or something and well i think we took it to um we did it in luton so two, two or three years ago, and we actually re photographed some people in Luton into the bigger project. And there was some, I found, you know, Luton's always given such a bad name. There were some amazing projects going on. I mean, there's a, a family that I met who have something called the Curry Kitchen, and the whole family gets together on Fridays and they make all this food and they take it out to the streets and give it, feed the homeless and things. And it was just so amazing to see all this stuff that was being done that yeah. no one ever hears about, you know. Um, can you just 
think that the Muslim, just touching on like things that people don't often hear about, um, so that there's so much work going on in the field of art and photography and creativity and culture, but we just, I think, so it's not really a problem in society, but we not often given a platform or a voice to kind of push it out there, or it's like unseen or doesn't, as you said, with the, the British Muslim project, like given the credibility that it deserves. And why, like, why do you think that might be? Because it's something think, we discuss on Sacred Footsteps a lot. Yeah, I, I think my thoughts on it is that it's fairly new. If you think about, I mean, for years I was taking pictures and the Muslim community was not interested in what I was doing, but, you know, I mean, they just were not interested in photography or anything. And then 9-11 happened. And then my phone started ringing like crazy. And this yeah. mosque and that mosque saying, oh, I've got all these English people coming to the mosque. Do you think you could come and do a presentation? And it's like, suddenly I was like on everyone's list. And it was suddenly, oh, we have a problem. We don't know how to communicate with the... And so I think at that point, then the young people began to take courage that they could do arts after being told for years that photography was forbidden you know music was forbidden so i think in a way the arts to the youth is quite new and don't forget i've been doing this for like 50 years so it's kind of what i've been doing but i think we will see in in, in and we're already beginning to see people who are excelling at the arts that they do so we will see people who work will be outstanding really and yeah. i think that's important yeah and maybe the the platforms we have now so pay homage to that so Instagram and things like that allow people to yes. be accessible and and showcase their work um yeah. so like just touching on what you said then about suddenly 9-11 happened and then everybody was interested because you're Muslim and doing photography yes. it's uh, safe to say that religion or primarily Islam has played a part in your work and influenced it and you've often shown a really intricate side of the Muslim world that is not seen um, and so, uh, I guess like some some of the photographs I think show like secrets of architecture and and culture that we are probably not privy to um, even as Muslims when we visit these places. So what what was your what was your intention or inspiration to showcase Islam primarily as a subject matter in your work? You know, my photography has always followed my own interests. I've always made that kind of one of my rules. I, I've kind of turned down some very big jobs just because they may have paid me a lot of money, but mm -hmm. I just didn't feel that I could put my heart into it. Yeah. And so if you look at my work, it's always followed my own interests, like the musicians in the 60s. That was my interest at the time. I did a whole project on gypsies because I was interested in gypsies. Oh, okay. I did a whole project on street tramps. So it's always kind of followed. So when I went to India, I took my cameras and it followed my own spiritual thing. So when I accepted Islam, it was just, it just accompanied me in doing what I did. But, you know, I'm not, I don't consider myself a religious person. I mean, I'm, I didn't become a Muslim because I wanted a religion. I wanted spirituality. I knew that spirituality was the cure for my own heart and my own challenges. And so I don't consider, because I find sometimes that people produce art, but it's got religion stuck on top of it do you know what i mean we have to remember that we're human beings and yeah. spirituality is a way to express our art and and we need obviously to go inwards so that we can find that creativity doesn't come from us it's a gift from god you know even bob dylan who i still have huge respect for talked about at the height of his career that he was grabbing these songs from the class, you know, that were just passing through, that somehow he was pulling them in and writing them down. It's yeah. like this stuff is out there. You just have to tune into it. Yeah, and, and I, I think with, like, with Bob Dylan and like when you read the writing now, and it is poetry, you do think, I think the authenticity of it is something that can't be copied in that high. Like we see variations of it now in modern music, but... Yes. Like when I listen to Bob Dylan and the music and the lyrics, like for me, that's like, it's perfect for its time, but it's transcendent. Absolutely. And so I think that's also really important for photography. Like it needs to transcend time and boundaries, which Absolutely. I firmly believe what photography does. I've had the In the Shade of the Tree book since I was 15 and I've still got it. I still look at it. 
um, and it still speaks to me. And I think that's and, and what you were saying about sort of your art has followed you, it's because I think that's where authenticity comes from. So if you're really doing what you love and you channel it into your work, people are going to resonate with it. Um, so just like based on other photographers and works that you've seen, it's probably quite a basic question. I don't know if anyone's asked you, but who are your favourite photographers? And oh, yeah, I love this, I love this question because I... When, when we do the workshops, one of the things I do is just talk about other photographers who have inspired me. <laughs> and so there's a whole list, there's a whole list of kind of art of seeing people that we respect as masters. I mean, for the, I think most unknown and who really influenced me a lot, this is in later years, this is, not, I'm not talking about the 60s, there's a French couple called uh, Roland and Sabrina Michaud. And, uh, they were in Afga Afghanistan before the wars and their images of Afghanistan are just incredible. And he's a really master, I call him the Sheikh of photography. Now what is unknown is that they are in fact Muslims, that couple. And uh, I, I knew about them since, since um, uh, very early 70s, their work and stuff. And we'd never met and uh, I, I think this was a few years ago, I, I, I said, I need to just, I've got to meet him. I'm getting on, he's getting on. He never has any, he never had like um, email or telephone or anything. The only way I could reach out to him was, was a fax. So yeah. I sent a fax <laughs> off to him. I said, it's coming to Paris. Is there any chance we could meet? You know, I've, I've followed your work for a long time. And then I never heard anything. 10 days later, the phone rang and he said, hi, this is Roland. Yeah, we're there that day, we're traveling the next day. Please come and have tea. So I went and when he opened the door, he said, what took you so long? <laughs> and we were only meant to stay with him for an hour. We spent four hours and I it just, it was one of the highlights of my life to meet him. And he's, he's an amazing photographer. And he'd never, up to that day, used a digital camera or anything. Oh, and wow. Yeah, so he, they, they are definitely worth looking at. I mean, Don McCullen, I took, he's from the 60s time. He's a war photographer. I have a huge respect for him because in the 60s, he went to all these war zones because he wanted to show what was happening to try and change things. And he himself says that he feel like everything he did, he didn't change anything. But I said to him, you did, you changed, you affected people like me and really made us really want peace in the world. You know, it showed us the, the, the madness of war, you know, which he showed in his images. They're very powerful. Mm -hmm. so there are many, uh, uh, who else? Platon, if you're interested in portrait photographer, mm -hmm. photography, there's a young, I don't know if he's young now, but it's a guy called Platon, he lives in New York. Okay. And he says about his photography, it's 97% psychology, only 3% of it is photography. Okay. And there's loads of stuff of him on YouTube. He's fascinating, really. These are all the people who talk about. And then cinematography, uh, Victoria Storaro, we talk about him. He's made some of the greatest films. He's made this film about the Prophet Islam, which has been banned for the last few years. He made it with uh, the Iranian director, Majid Majidi. It's just about to be released and uh, uh, be uh, available on certain platforms. Okay. Um, it's an incredible film. I've just watched the first 40 minutes and I was just, it's so beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things and you feel proud to be a Muslim. It's just incredible. And the, the story, how Storaro, he, he was in a hotel somewhere in the world and someone had sent him a book about the life, the childhood of the prophet Muhammad. And he's made films about Buddhism and all kinds. He made Apocalypse Now, Reds, The Last Emperor. I mean, he's made incredible films. Oh. He said he was reading this book. And as he was reading it, he was imagining it. He could see it. And he often talks about the faculty of the imagination, that we're given this gift of imagination. <laughs> we can see things before they become a reality. So he was reading this book and he could see it visually. He said, I finished the book. I shut the book, I put it down on the coffee table and a message came into my computer at that moment. 
it was from Majid Majidi saying, I'm making a film about the, life, the childhood of the Prophet Muhammad, will you be the cinematographer on it? It was as instant as that. And the first thing he said to him when he met him was, will this film divide people or will it unite them? And what's happened, it's been banned for three years. Why was it banned? Why is it banned? Because people say you can't show the form of, and but he hasn't really shown, he's a child. It's talking about the early years of the thing, but it's so beautiful, really. I, when you see the, the story of Abraha and the elephants, my goodness. Okay, it's, it's so we're really going to get, we're gonna have to get this list that you said, put you yeah. and we'll put it in the video when it's ready. Um, I've got another question, which is another favorite question. Um, and I, I just like simple questions. So also touching on what your favorite, what has your favorite place been to visit? <laughs> and I, that's a really, really tough one. I it's always get asked question. that one. Okay. I, always, I always say it's the last place I went to. At the moment it's my home, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not taking pictures here, but I'm working on all my old pictures, which is so much fun. So I don't know. I mean, it's we like we have a running joke in this house because I never go anywhere for holidays. I just go for because I want to take pictures mm. and my family like to have holidays and I don't do holidays. Mm. So we were saying, why can't we do a project in the Seychelles or the Maldives or Mauritius or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there not? Perfect, great destinations too. Um, okay, so um, I have um, sort of like a final question um, and then I think we can sort of draw it to a close unless you had anything else you wanted to add. Um, and it's just talking a little bit about um, sort of the, more about the art of seeing workshops and also your, your next plans and, and ventures and what, what we can, get excited about next that you're working on projects, if you can disclose that um, for us. Faisal always likes to dream big. I mean, he was like, Iran, let's go to Iran or Jerusalem. I'm going, yeah. just being in those places is a problem, let alone have like a bunch of students <laughs> running around with cameras. And yeah. I want to go somewhere simple like Granada or Morocco or something, somewhere where no. I know I can have a problem, you know. So yeah, he likes to dream big. Um, we had planned to do one in Malaysia as an incredible retreat in uh, uh, near the near the Thailand border. A friend of mine has a huge piece of land that he's built all these wooden houses on stilts and everything. It's a beautiful place. We were going to do that this year, but obviously we've had to cancel it now. I don't know. We're we're looking at different things, but because of the lockdown, we're trying to do stuff online to see how we can develop that. But it's you know we're just trying to adapt to it. But I do miss. I mean it's. I love doing them. We, I meet such amazing people and get to spend five days with them. It's, it's like this. It's like this extended family. So my my daughter's always complaining about these adopted children we have around the around the world, who are the art of seeing uh, yeah. family members. So yeah. that's really lovely, though. It's it's really lovely that you've got, you've sort of got that interaction. Yeah, I did um, add this thing about. Um, you know, you were asking me about the 60s thing and the, yeah. the meetings of mountains. Um, you know, when I photographed those people in the 60s, it was really a way for me to have a one-to-one -one with them yeah. without having that uncomfortable thing of being in, you know, like, you know, their celebrities and stuff. I just, so looking at them through my camera was a way to see them as they are because you see their music or their lyrics because the best of them but i wanted to see them you know directly and i think that is what i carried on to meetings with mountains was really was having a one-to-one -one with those people um to really see them as they are you know and that and then that it's so in some ways it's not different it's it's it's, it's the same process yeah. yeah i don't think i can see that I can see that in your work and I saw the sort of um, the journey almost between yeah. then and now. Um, so that was really prominent to me. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in, um, so I think we can ask them. And okay. then my so the first one, someone's asked, um, let me just scroll and see what it is. Um, how is it like to meet the saints who belong to the Ahlul Bayt? 
that's one of the questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, meeting any proper saint is always an incredible experience. I think what always from the Ahlabayt is that it's something about them. I, it's in their genes. You know, many of them hardly ever sleep. Hardly, you know, they have this energy. It's just quite, I mean, I've keel over. I can't keep up with them, you know. They're just, just endless energy and stuff like Habib Ali and Habib Omar. It's just, it's just phenomenal for me to watch, you know. I mean, sometimes God is gracious with me and I'm able to, when I'm working, sometimes I get this in, but not to the level that they do, especially with the Ibadar and stuff. Just can't keep up with them. It's incredible, you know. It's a gift they have, really. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that was the question. There's another question, but I'm not quite sure I understand the context. It's talking about the ideas of Rumi. Um, it's not actually a question. It's more like a statement. I don't know. What's the thing? It says, have you come across ideas or poems of Rumi? I mean, I guess being Muslim, we all have, or even Muslim, yeah. um, I suppose. Um, I don't know about yeah i'm not quite sure what the question wants Maybe to ask. trying to say can you translate that into images and i think it's very you know when i when i did in the shade of the tree i had the pictures first and then i had to find the thing i don't think i could ever do it the other way around yeah yeah i think it's possible if you have an image to find something that adds another dimension to that image but to have a thing and then try and find a picture yeah. Is, is, is yeah i can imagine that's really i don't think yeah i'm not sure anybody i know has ever done it that yeah. way around um, and yeah. there's another question that's just come in did your parents encourage you to become a photographer i guess it's trying to say did it come from yourself was it a rebellious act or did you um, i think my parents wanted me to get a proper job which i did have for a few years but uh, and then i dropped out and got into music and stuff and I did all kinds of stuff. I did modeling. I did. I worked in films and stuff. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to get into, you know, a, a screen of some sort. I did think it was going to be films at first, but then I kind of fell into photography. And then I re found out later that my grandfather was a photographer and quite an incredible photographer. But he died when I was 16. And so when I knew him, he'd all, he wasn't very good at business, a bit like me. So he struggled to, to kind of make a living at it. And uh, so we never had that conversation. But my mother gave me some of his pictures and they're, they're incredible. When I look at them now, they're really, he really was gifted. So I, inshallah, I think I inherited something from him. And because my mother, she used to, she used to hand tint pinches for him. So, so she always had kind of small cameras and stuff. So they're not proper cameras. So it just kind of, there always were cameras around in my family. So it was kind of natural process for me, I think. Yeah, that's a creative environment was already there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think um, we can wrap up there. Thank you so much for yeah. To you. Um, you asked good questions, it was good. Got my brain working. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've been wanting to ask these for quite a long time, so I'm glad I, I got the opportunity, alhamdulillah. Um, we'll post this on our social media and Facebook, and That's I'll try and compile the list of your recommendations because I think people would really appreciate that. Um, but thank you, and I hope you have a good rest of your Ramadan. Yeah. Thank you. Love it. Yeah, that was good. Oh, okay.